Good evening, everyone. Thank you all very much for being here. I will try and deal with a very <coughs> wordy title that I'm speaking about today and try and explain why it is that we need to think about what we call visual lexicons and iconographic vocabularies and what are the needs that art history has in a digital age. These are questions that I think are particularly relevant to people who are interested in funding the arts and managing the arts, to be able to understand how quickly our discipline is changing and what our discipline needs. It's very onerous to have to give this talk. <clears throat> Usually, this is the kind of keynote about the state of art history that one is invited to give when one's nearing retirement. I, uh, I've been asked as a sort of a mid-career art historian to be able to tackle a beast, really looking at where our field is going and what is happening to the field. So I'm gonna try and give it to you from that perspective and not from the perspective of somebody much more senior to me who would have perhaps addressed this talk with a different set of imperatives. I come to you as somebody who is a curator who has to work within Indian institutions and I want to try and bring to light what kind of platforms we use at the first instance when we start our work, how do we teach, how do we study, how do we know our, our, our art history, and how do we start disseminating that? Every press reporter who came to interview me for this exhibition asked this one ghisa pita question each time, which was, how did you know where all these objects were lying? How did you discover all these objects? Did you have to travel to all these museums? And the truth is, yes, I did. I did have to. Now, if you ask the same question of my colleagues in other countries in the world, they don't always have the same answers because they have databases that they can rely on, massive archives, enormous. <clears throat> when I was a student of classical archaeology, we used to be privileged to be able to go to a site and study it. We used to work in libraries. And then came up LIMC the Lexicon Iconographic, Iconographicum Mythologiae Classicae. Extraordinary archive that is based out of France where all the leading philologists, archeologists, numismatists, and art historians have collaborated to create the world's largest archive of classical imagery of Europe. So that means Greek and Roman art. This is the most definitive archive that exists in our discipline at the moment. Its scholarship is unmatched. An archive, now let's just stop for a second. An archive has become a much abused word over the past decade, I feel, and I need to say this, and no offense intended. Everything is an archive these days. Everyone uses this word archive in curatorial practice. Everyone quotes from an archive these days. <clears throat> I'm not talking about a family album here. I'm talking about the creation of a repository like what we would call a mama archive, <laughs> which can contain the many smaller archives within it. So how do you create a digital archive that is actually going to be of use to scholarship how are they all going to be linked together? Let me just give you a few pages from LIMC and how it works for you to be able to get to understand how exhaustive it is. Even subscribing to this archive is something that we at JNU can't afford. So I go to libraries like the Getty or I go to Oxford and there I have access to LIMC. 
the print edition of the archive, which is updated and comes up with supplementary volumes every year, but no library in India has a set. the world's largest digital resource of Greco-Roman imagery, but we don't have one. Let's look at another, Art Store. You've all heard of JSTOR. Now this is the visual equivalent, it's called Art Store. How do you create such a huge database? How does everyone who has an archive give their archive into a, meta, a mega archive like JSTOR? What are the rules that govern the sharing of knowledge. Can you imagine the legal teams that work at being able to have a terms that is fair for different partisans, for different participants to be able to use this? It sounds very straightforward. We all need databases on the basis of which we can categorize information. Every discipline requires its own type of data to be categorized. The way in which art history is categorized poses very genuine and unique problems that are greatly in need to be addressed in India at the moment. Now, what limitations does India face? You write Shiva. He writes Siva. Somebody writes it with a diacritic. Somebody writes it without. When you're searching for information, if you make the mistake of searching under the wrong name, you won't get access to the archive. So now we come into philological concerns. Was Heracles spelt the same way for the past 2,000 years? Did the Romans spell it as Hercules? The Greeks spelt it as Heracles? The Greeks may spell it as Heracles with a K, but we transliterate it as Heracles with a C. Dionysus, is it going to be spelt with an O or with a U? Very simple problems. But where's the algorithm that is going to make it possible for a student researcher who is actually trying to access this information to be able to get to Siva even if the person is searching for Shiva? Very small, it seems to you. Massive, because the person who needs to create it has to be a, a Sanskrit scholar, a, Persi a Persian scholar, um, has to be able to know all the different Indian vernaculars, to be able to know Pali, to be able to know how it is written in different scripts, just so that somewhere in the back end, somebody is making all those connections so that the end user, which you were just speaking about, has access to the knowledge that they require. So we have to log in to be able to do this, and these companies have to spend their money on generating an entire cadre of specialists who are going to be employed. Now, going digital has become a buzzword in India. Everyone wants to go digital for their archives. Everyone wants money to go digital. What does that mean? That you're going to be given four computers and six scanners? No, thank you. That doesn't help anyone any. We need the 40 researchers who know their Sanskrit and their Persian and their Pali who are going to be able to feed in the correct data who need to be funded. Otherwise, it's just hardware and it's just scanned images that aren't going anywhere at the moment. We talk about the art loss register and we've been talking about the threat to antiquities and to art collections by disseminating them. You'd be surprised as to how many repositories are against digitization and dissemination because they still believe that by popularization and making their data available to people, they are actually in breach of some copyright or they are threatening themselves by advertising their collections, not safeguarding them. So there's a reverse psychology that actually believes that having the data available on a public platform might generate, might create a risk to the archive and to the institution rather than helping the institution. Conversely, let's look at a situation of something called the Portable Antiquities Scheme. The Portable Antiquities Scheme started in Britain only about 10 years ago. And this is a screenshot that I took in preparation for today's talk two days ago. And it tells you that in the past 10 years, 
1,325,000 objects have been discovered in the British Isles. What is the Portable Antiquities Scheme? It's a scheme where anyone who is a grave digger or an antiquities finder, a metal detectorist who is roaming around, who's finding antiquities in his village or in the local well, instead of turning that person and calling that person a smuggler or an illegal raider, what the British government did was create something called the Portable Antiquities Scheme where they became helpers of the government by giving them financial incentives to disclose where they discovered the object and giving you the correct provenance information. As a result, because the compensation they were being given was equivalent to what they would have got from the market in any case, why should they do something illegal? Now, not only has the discover, person who discovered the object got his money, but you have opened up an entire uh, an entire industry of knowledge that has opened up at the university level because now in 10 years alone you have over a million more objects and antiquities that are known to you that come from British history in 10 years than you had previously. But in India, to achieve the same purpose, we have a regulation in place which is demands that each person who discovers or has an antiquity much, must register it in a cyclostyled form with the Archaeological Survey of India in triplicate. Right? Three copies of it are given to the ASI along with photographs to be able to register an antiquity. How many antiquities has the ASI registered? Not in the past 10 years, but in the past 70 does not equal to how much has come out of a little country like Britain in the past 10 years. Is there something that we are missing out on the enormous benefit that can be leveraged when you are really committed to the digitization of archives? How can it be used for the governance of art history is something we really need to be taking on much more seriously in our country than we have addressed so far. The nature of these institutions, investment in the maintenance of their digital archives, in how they link separate archives, in thinking about the copyright conventions and lexicons, has in no way diminished the work that is being done by the librarians and archivists who already worked in their institutions. They've not been rendered unemployed. What it has required instead is the opening up of job opportunities for dozens of philologists and iconographers who have to work alongside data retrieval specialists and those who build algorithms that enhance the digital recognition and sorting of data. So what you're actually doing, you're not cutting down any work. And this is something that we really need to understand that where our discipline is poised, digitization is not going to make it simpler. Digitization is actually enhancing the job profiles and the number of people who can work in that industry manifold. Now, are the consumers of this increasing manifold? Because if you don't have enough consumers, none of this is a profitable venture for anyone to enter into. Then we are talking about philanthropic work that needs to be done for the sake of the preservation and the, of, of the material as well as for the enhancement of knowledge. So in India, the archive that we use most is one that was created by the American Institute of Indian Studies where a group, a consortium of Ivy League colleges in the United States started funding the documentation of Indian arts in the 1960s and 70s particularly in the 70s. Their photographs from the 1970s form the bedrock of all pedagogy on Indian art history at the moment. That is the true archive that we all end up using when we want to do any research. Now, something else we need to understand parallelly. Digital content providers have to work alongside those who already work in the field of print content. 
just like a documentary filmmaker who opens up an entirely new media platform which works alongside conventional research, so too does the digital. What we have inadequately understood, therefore, is how this entirely new industry has opened up, which is in no way threatening or diminishing or replacing the existing pedagogy or the existing specialization. In fact, what we have really not understood is that the digital is not an indulgence, but a massive requirement for which we are financially unprepared as a nation and as a professional community. Opening up an entire sector of jobs, one would imagine, would be advantageous to government policy. The infrastructural requirements that come with it, however, are a financial burden for which there are unsatisfactory models of revenue generation. How will the investment and maintenance costs of these archives be met? We don't have clean answers because nobody's actually really been thinking about these matters, I think, enough. So the Kalpana Trust, which is engaging with art education and conservation, matters that lie at the root of how museums function and what they do, I offer you these thoughts because I think they are worth thinking about as we enter the last week of India and the world. What have we come to learn in the last two years in the run-up to this exhibition, and especially in the last three months of this exhibition? Is the idea of an exhibition itself passé in the digital world, as many people had argued? And I can see that many of you would actually believe that it is not, because people have actually learned something in the process of engaging with the works themselves. Was it possible to write the catalog and do the research for this exhibition without digital databases, on the other hand? No, it was not. So traditional methods of data gathering and presentation have to work alongside the digital. So as we search, and I was giving you these examples, what problems were there? Well, building cultural capital in democratic ways or how is a museum going to be a place to address large publics? Certainly pushes certain questions, as has pushed during this exhibition, has brought them to the fore for us. It's been path-breaking, yes, but it's been an extraordinary learning curve, and I say that with great humility. It's what you have enabled by allowing this exhibition to happen is the opportunity for us to learn what we need to do. I don't think we, this is an exhibition where we can rest on laurels on what we have achieved. I think this has been an exhibition that has made it blatantly obvious as to what massive lacunae exist in the infrastructure and governance of art in India and what needs to be done. Those fissures, the incompetencies, the unpreparedness I say with all humility, not because I'm not proud of what we have achieved as an extraordinary team which I have got to work with, which has been the best team I've ever worked with anywhere. But I still believe and I've become aware of how much we have to learn through this experience. And I think that is something that I think we need to be able to put down because otherwise we wouldn't have been honest enough to see wh what our learning potential and learning curve is, where we are heading. I think the biggest question that confronted me as a curator was how is the subaltern to be represented in contemporary times in institutions like this? This exhibition forced us to look at these matters. I'm going to switch after setting out these broad parameters to some visual, practical instances by starting to show you actual things where I felt we could make a difference and how we could learn. Now, because I'm a specialist on Indian art, I'll focus on the Indian material today. And what I've tried to do in my past two major exhibitions 
and how I feel they have helped us in the field of art history. Art history. <laughs> That's a funny and a very loaded word. And I should say that with some caution. Because we're not really producing art historians anymore, even in the academy, at the university. The theoretical turn that has come in our field has made issues more attractive than data content. So it's very boring for somebody to know the chronology of a particular artist's work in Noorpur. It's not enough. It's irrelevant. Suddenly, it's more relevant to talk about his politics, his global, con his global connections, his social and political context in which he lived. What are his gender politics? How does he think of all of those? The, th the theoretical turn has become much more exciting for us, rather than actually the documentation of the object itself. Balancing a respect for visual language and taxonomies, alongside the seductive analytical paradigms for post-structuralist or post-colonial research, is not what our institutions are being able to provide. So I'm depressed when I tell you that after two decades of teaching and working in art history, I have a handful of students whom I can rely on to help me as assistants. Seemingly simple and good research is in fact extremely difficult to develop because it's considered passé. So how are we going to do this? You know, it's all very well to become theoretical. But we in India are still at the fact-finding stage of Indian art history. We're still finding new archives, new schools new of painting or of sculpture. We don't know what to do when we come across post-Gupta sculpture because we're confused. We don't know where to categorize it. And because we don't know how to categorize it, we don't know how to put in the metadata for it in the digital archive. And so it slips through the archive because we don't have a vocabulary for it. Are you going to call it Gupta? Are you going to call it Solanki? Or are you going to call it Chandela? Or are you going to call it what? But it doesn't fit any of those categories. It's one of those in-between pieces. And it's not one. There are thousands of these pieces. Work in any museum, and you will discover how difficult it is because you actually can't categorize. You don't have a dynastic label for, for the object. And we don't really know. When we write our books and when we do exhibition catalogs, we have to write 100 words. So we can't actually share with the public how little we know. We can't actually involve them in the complexity of our field because we have to give digested information which comes across as if we know what we are talking about in pithy labels. You would be surprised as to the kind of hoops we go through in research just to be able to give a four-line label to an object. Is it really 600 AD? How do you really know that? On what basis? And behind it lies an entire essay of things that you have considered. But it'll never make it because all you fed into the archive is the date. So, the intention of both exhibitions has been to be able to bring familiar chestnuts to the audience, but also try and enhance the canon by making new materials known to the audience. Then we come up with the old one. How are we to deal with folk and tribal art? Is that going to be put into the same archives? At what terms? So we began and we ended the exhibition quite consciously with objects that don't form the mainstream canon of classical Indian art. Why? Because that's India. And it's a parallel and a strong voice all through Indian art history. So if you want to teach Indian art history, you can't really do it without an ethno-archaeological approach, without being able to look at the material culture, the living culture of India, alongside the classical and the dead cultures. 
In the body in Indian art, we did the same thing. We integrated the folk and tribal along with contemporary studio practice into a continuum. We deliberately opened the show with a warrior from Nagaland. We wanted to make a statement that you come to India from the Northeast. We wanted to put it right at the forefront of the exhibition that this is what you see when you come to India, you come to the Northeast. Yes, of course we can make political statements when we stage exhibitions curatorially. But also, the politics of the of behind it comes out of a lot of plain and simple solid art historical research where we are not making a mistake in our iconographic attribution or in the way that we are thematizing our exhibitions. I'll give you another example. Um, Gallery 3 in the body in Indian art was called Rebirth. For the scenography of the exhibition, we created a gravitas of Earth Mother, Sky Father. We deliberately used the skylight of the architect Victor Horta's de design of being able to have the, the skylight available to be able to use it for the idea of Sky Father. Can you imagine what the conservators had to say to me as a curator? You're doing a display manuscripts and paintings under daylight, right? It was a complete no-no. So how do I moderate and modulate the daylight? How do I know what's going to happen on a sunny day in Brussels versus a winter day in Brussels? How is the same exhibition going to work? What is the role of putting a contemporary sculpture with the glow of the evening, turning it into the Hiranyagarbha, which we had borrowed from the, uh, the Bharat Kala Bhavan to be able to show the golden egg and then use Subodh Gupta's golden egg to be able to and have yellow light in the evening? How does Sky Father still have a presence in the evening in the scenography instead of only being present in the daytime. There were strategies that we had to work out all the way through, but that, those strategies, those curatorial strategies, the scenographic strategies were only worked out because we had the idea and the concepts in place very firmly as to what that gallery was meant to communicate. So how did we juxtapose, for instance, images of Lajja Gauri with Mrinalini Mukherjee's hemp sculptures? Why did we bring in these different elements into the gallery? Again, like I said, creating a dado with the color of brown to be able to cre create that greater gra gravitas at the bottom of the gallery for what was the Earth Mother half of it. Now, the exhibition both exhibitions have challenged chronology, what we know of religion, what we know of language. When does Indian iconography begin? Does the Harappan have a bearing on later Indian art? Were the Calcolithic cultures Hindu and Brahmanical? These are tough questions to ask, but what do you do when you have evidence? Controversial though it may be, what do you do with that Varaha that you see over here? an extraordinary anthropomorph in the collection of the Archaeological Survey of India. So before elaborating on the larger aesthetic, political, and social concerns of the exhibition, what I thought I'd do is discuss the more conventional art historical concerns in terms of chronology, periodization of art styles, iconography, and the finding of new objects that have disturbed or added to the existing canon, all of which suggest several avenues for future research. For me, both exhibitions have not been, as I said, a conclusion of research, but as a starting point. I think I've been able to gather enough data to be able to guide enough PhD students for the rest, for the rest of my career. Indian art history remains tethered, as I was saying, to great epochs. And thus, commonly, public perception tends to exclude elements made just before or after the reign of a major dynasty or for that matter, objects that do not come from principal sites of that dynasty. So some examples are going to follow. For instance, in India and the world, we deliberately started with the Atiram Pakkam hand axe. And as you all know, when you read the labels, the discussion is about how the Atiram Pakkam hand axe challenges the history of India. 
what we know of the history and chronology of India. But it also was used by us to be able to pose the question that no one is an Indian. We're all out of Africa. Right? We begin by saying, anyone who is fighting for the rights and tradition of India will remember your ancestors eventually came here from somewhere. You were never here to begin with. Nobody was ever here to begin with. Everyone's a migrant, and therefore everyone's an Indian. Right? You begin by that. Then you, be, you, you move the narrative forward and you say, art, the film, the script for the film where you hear J.D. Hill speaking, he says that this is an aesthetic object. Now, remember, we were given, as curators, when we had to do our speeches, we worked on our scripts because we knew we had to communicate. We had 90 seconds or 120 seconds that we were told we had to speak in. What were we going to say in our 90 seconds to the public? that was going to be relevant enough. Now, most people will miss the point. But it's important to be able to talk about it at venues like this. The making of art is intrinsic to our species. So is the institution which houses art not going to be intrinsic to our species? Is a museum going to be so antithetical to the people of India? The other question, Indian art making is as old as the rest of the world, fine. Now when we say Indian, immediately the question comes, what do you mean by India? Atiram Pakkam, South India. Well, well, no, we can't afford to have these regional politics, so therefore right behind it you have a hand axe from Chittor, right? And of course, as a curator, I had found hand axes from the Northeast, I had found things from the Nagpur archive, because I said, okay, I have to cover my bases, I have to have East, West, North, South, all fully covered in this exhibition. So if you, now, from this jigsaw that we have put together, if you remove one element, does the exhibition still hold? Does the punch of the narrative still work? Can you just replace an object? Will it still have the same gravitas and validity? Or is the work of the curator only at the level of judging art styles and giving you pleasant work? Or is there greater thought that has lain behind each and every object? Who's judging that? Who's assessing that? Well, the question then comes, next object. Whose history are we actually looking at when we talk about India? Now, I've worked in foreign museums. And I've had the Indian ambassador in different countries coming and telling me, come to tell me, be very careful about your labeling. What are you calling Indian? What are you calling Pakistani? Is it a part of our history? Or are we signing it away to another nation state? We went through quite a serious amount of discussion when we were coming up with the Hindi title of our exhibition. Now I've talked about this previously. What are we going to do? when a lot of the objects don't come from the modern nation state of Bharat. They come from an older civilization where there were greater interconnections that were not divided by the modern nation state. <clears throat> so do these belong to this or do these belong to Pardesh? New discoveries that are completely challenging how we think about Indian art history. We didn't write in the catalog, but there seems to be a sun between the bull's horns. Any student of ancient art, especially from Egypt, recognizes that and immediately opens up the question, what were the pre-Indus Valley, pre-Harappan civilization people doing? What was the nature of their connections with Egypt? It immediately poses that question for us. Was it only happening in Baluchistan? Were there things happening like this in Eastern India? How much do we know of what was going on in the Bronze Age in Bengal? Remarkably little. The major textbooks that we have, whether it is Olchin's book or anyone, don't really illustrate what was going on in the Calcolithic period in Eastern India. So attention was drawn to the remarkable copper hoard objects made between 1500 and 300 BC 
occupying a time period between the Indus Valley and the Mauryan, an age that remains a perplexing hiatus for art historians till today. How are we enhancing the canon of Indian art history? You all know these three wonderful objects. You've seen them in the current exhibition. The beautiful agate bull which has attracted so many people's attention. Well, how was it discovered? It's unpublished. Where were these objects lying? Well, during the research for the body in Indian art, I had actually been able to get a, a mandate from the government of India, and it was thanks to them that I was able to go into every archive in the country, and the CSMVS was able to profit entirely from the research that I was able to do for the body in Indian art, because I was able to commandeer those objects. I could go back to the Haryana State Archaeology and tell them, but I know you have these objects. And Vaidehi is sitting at the back of this room, and she will tell you how reluctant they were to be able to actually lend us the objects for the longest time. Because the objects had gone AWOL. They didn't know where the objects were for six months. They couldn't retrieve the objects for us. They didn't have a location index, like every good museum does, to know where the objects are lying. They were so innocent, they even wrote to the CSMVS saying that we can't find the objects. Not realizing that by saying such a thing, they might have got themselves into a terrible pickle by saying that they've lost national treasures. Right? And so there was I in the backstages calling up the chief secretary of Haryana trying to say something and they've been so innocent in writing these letters and saying that they don't know where the objects are. Somebody's going to end up getting suspended in your department. Please prevent this from happening. How are you going to stop it? But why was I pushing for it? Well, because there's only one museum in Haryana, which is the Kurukshetra Shri Krishna Museum. The government of Haryana does not actually have a museum with any trained personnel. They didn't know how to fill out their loan forms. They didn't know how to do the insurance work for this artwork. They didn't know how to lend it to CSMVS. It's not that they didn't want to. They first couldn't find it. And when they found it, they didn't know what to do with, how to, how to lend it. These are very serious concerns. They're very simple matters of how to train. Now, the reason for bringing attention to these objects was in this exhibition, as well as in the previous one, we found fantastic objects from Haryana to be able to show that there's more that happens in Haryana than just the GT road. There's more that happens in Haryana than just agriculture. That there are extraordinary sites which are lying buried in that state. Will this exhibition act as a leveraging point for the bureaucracy of that state to be able to create a museum for themselves. Have we not demonstrated that there is enough international attention that has been brought to a state which doesn't have a museum for itself? How will they then enter, at what terms will they enter our archive? Ditto these Chinese dishes. They've never been published entirely new discoveries that were put forth. The CSMVS's gravestone. What a rich and remarkable history it has, these, both these objects. One might come from the family of Ferdinand Magellan and, and Barbosa. We never knew that till we actually read the inscriptions on them. And it's got people in Portugal in a twist about this particular object. And now they want to write papers on it. And I'm told that there's going to be a massive ASI exhibition on these 70 Chinese dishes, which are the world's oldest known blue and white dishes of this quality, which have been found in Tughlaqabad in Delhi. Again, massive new discoveries. In the previous exhibition, similarly, I put together this mask of Shiva that comes from Peshawar, or that extraordinary terracotta that comes from the Hindu Shahi period, a Ganesh from the seventh century that was found in Kabul. Now, we've always looked at art from the Northwest frontier in Afghanistan for its Buddhist leanings or for its Ghaznavid leanings, but we've, so little has been written about what happens between the fourth century AD and the 10th century in Gandhara. 
Did we even know that there were all these Hindu sculptures in the Northwest frontier and in Afghanistan? So we are in India still at the level, as I was saying, of fact finding. Exhibitions like this are not just to show to the world the richness of India, but they are used to bring focus to marginalized epochs, to unknown masterpieces of Indian art. They are also to question some of the fundamental premise, some of the fundam fundamental premises of Indian art history and the politics that lies behind Indian art history are called into question. Is the chronology of Indian art and religion the same? The first few objects have already questioned that. Let's look at this particular remarkable statue called the Dvilingi Lakulish, which lies now in the Bhopal Museum, but we all studied it as students in the Indore Museum. Well, a Shaivite statue being shown with two phalluses? But Chandramohan only lived now, na, in Baroda? But what were they doing with this so many years ago? And why was this artist not censored? And did he go and create some arson in the Baroda campus and burn down the university because he wasn't given his degree? The crime is the same? Or is this blasphemy? Because you don't know enough about Shaivism, is this to be regarded as being blasphemous? Remarkable pieces, what do you call it? Is it Gupta style? Post-Gupta style? Which category do you want to fit it into? Extraordinary things that are coming up all over the country. Now both these pieces come from Chhattisgarh. How many books have you read about the art history of Chhattisgarh? Fact finding. This extraordinary Naga statue comes from the door jamb, the entrance to a temple. It now lies in the Bhopal Museum. It's made of a particular type of sandstone. The reason I brought it into the exhibition was because no conservator could answer basic questions about the kind of material that is being used by the artists of Chhattisgarh for their, which quarries were they using, and were they choosing the stone deliberately in order to be able to make it commensurate with the subject matter of the sculpture. So this is a stone which naturally flakes and starts looking like the scales of a snake. How appropriate that it is used for a Nagaraj. Next to it, we have the extraordinary, well, I don't even know what to call it, giant sculpture from Tala in Chhattisgarh. Right? <clears throat> I'll come to this, I'll come back to this sculpture in two minutes. When we have art exhibitions, there is great demand on the curator. Oh, you must have Chola bronzes. Yeah, we must have Chola bronzes. But must it always be an Ataraj? What about the fact that we want to show a beautiful Chola Buddha bronze? And the CSMVS has one of the most beautiful ones. The Chennai Museum has another dozen extraordinary pieces that so seldom get seen in international art exhibitions and get publicized. Why is it important to be able to resuscitate a Buddhist history of Tamil Nadu? Extremely political to be able to do that. Or there is the other thing, what happens with the case of Vijayanagar bronzes? Hardly ever get mentioned in art history exhibitions because they're not considered as important as Chola bronzes, so they get left out of the art history writing. I'm not even talking about the Achyut Rajpur bronzes. <laughs> now anyone who's a student of Buddhist iconography you can't really do Vajrayana without studying Achyut Rajpur bronzes. Yet till today, we have only one little monograph by Debala Mitra on Achyut Rajpur bronzes. Nearly a hundred of these bronzes lie in the, base, in the reserved collection of the Bhubaneswar Museum. No iconography student who works on Vajrayana has surprisingly not been considering Achyut Rajpur bronzes in their studies. It's, it's shocking. So here is a fantastic Vajrahunkara. It prefigures all that we see in Tibetan and Nepali iconography by at least 250 years earlier in Orissa. Calligraphy in South Asia. How many students of Indo-Islamic art history have been actually looking at the history of Indian calligraphy and actually studied the Qutub Minar's calligraphy? 
that you know there are only two studies till today, just two, and they only look at the calligraphy on the minar. The rest of the calligraphy at the site has never been studied, never been documented. It's the earliest solid Islamic, Indo-Islamic calligraphy. The museum is a place which houses evidence. The museum is a place where that evidence can be interpreted by people in each time for their own purpose. What spin I, as a curator, put on that evidence is different from what the next generation of curators will do when they start working in our institutions. But is the institution not going to display the evidence it has because it is too coward, cowardly? Now, in the body in Indian art, we displayed Miraj Nama paintings. Today, paintings of the Prophet are considered haram. So they are never shown. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist. So the Director General of the National Museum was very careful. He gave me permission to display it, but he was aware of the fact that Imam Bukhari will come from Jama Masjid and knock on his door and tell him to remove it. So then we had to have an answer ready. Is the museum a secular space? Is the museum going to be able to display the evidence it has of times past? We are not preaching from the pulpit. We are not reading out the namaz on Friday from our mosques, or we are not permitting worship in our temples, which are the museums. We are allowing people to be able to come into our space to be able to interpret that evidence time and again as they need to. We are the keepers of evidence. Do you know any keeper of evidence that is so badly treated by government? Because wars are being fought in the name of cultural tradition these days. But that tradition is not being expressed in the public because people aren't being able to come to the museum to see the evidence. So opinions are being made that this never used to happen. Now, if the museum is the keeper of evidence, it is also, at the same time, the producer of knowledge, because it interprets that evidence with every exhibition. And so we had one opportunity in this last exhibition to be able to counter a colonial narrative of history. Right? We had an opportunity to be able to say, it's not just the world history the way it's been told by our colonizers, but we're telling a history of India and the world, that we may have a different view of world history. And so we very strategically placed this object in the show. Now I've talked about it at length previously. So the, the object is, what is this object about? Well, as I was saying, every object in the show was selected for multiple reasons, many of which even our own museum personnel or conservators or art historians didn't always appreciate in one go. But we had to think about it as a curator. I had to think about it from five different perspectives simultaneously. What object am I using that is going to be used to tell a counter narrative to colonial history? How can I employ an object to tell that story? Because the expectation of me as a curator is to be able to counter that narrative. But the expectation of me as a curator was also to be able to bring new objects to light, and rather than showing the same old things that people have seen time and again. So, we all know that the jewel in the British Museum's crown is Amravati. But this sculpture tells us, which is in the Amravati style, that the real jewel is the sacrifice of the jewel which is exactly what we have done with Amravati, right? And so we come to the point that at what terms are we engaging with the knowledge? Will the sacrifice of the materiality to the crown is what we have done? Well, that is what we are doing in India. Fanigiri, has anyone been to Fanigiri here and seen the site? The hundreds of sculptures that were recovered from Fanigiri in Telangana, when you go to the site museum, you'll see them in cardboard boxes smashed in hundreds and hundreds of smithereens. It'll take a conservation team decades to be able to restore even a handful of the sculptures of Fanigiri. This, apart from three others, 
is one of the lone survivors of Fanigiri's extraordinary pieces. Most remarkable site in India. So it is also to be able to open up the canon, as I was saying, opening up our ways of thinking about new ways, unpublished paintings, to be able to think about technique of Indian art. What do we know? I mean, we're learning new things all the time. We've never seen brushwork like this previously. We wanted to be able to question the narrative, to be able to bring the contemporary into that narrative for a very important reason, because the contemporary is questioning the terms of globalization. Globalization is such a buzzword these days. And I thought Tallur's sculpture on Unicode addressed this need and requirement in the exhibition clearly. It's the one work that talks about homogenization and globalization, and yet how that packaging is still in Indian packaging. Calling it Unicode was such a clever title by the artist. The god is one of concrete and money. The packaging of it, the memory of it, is something that is Indian. Are these the terms, then, at which we are engaging with the British Museum? Are these the terms at which we are accepting their narrative as a part of our narrative? Is this all just chaos, as I asked at the end of the exhibition? Let's look at another contemporary political matter. The body in Indian art behind that Naga statue, when you entered the exhibition, I don't know how many of you saw it, there was this Veera Sati and Veera Kal that came from Varangal in um, Telangana. There are no real books on Kakatiya art and sculpture, very little. When we see this sculpture, you see a man disemboweling himself and you see a woman with a blade at her throat. They're two people who are being celebrated for being war heroes, martyrs. Now when you look at the sculpture carefully, you'll see that when the man goes up to heaven, there are two apsaras on either side with chauris who are celebrating his ascension. When you look at the woman, you see that there are two apsaras waiting for her also in heaven. Is sati something that we exonerate? Is it equal to have apsaras waiting for men and women in heaven? Are women never permitted to have pleasure outside of marriage? Then the other question, apart from a gender discourse, Jihad and martyrdom in Christianity, whether it is the Crusades or in Islam, remain volatile political debates. Were Hindus also martyrs? This is a question that needs to be asked. Were Hindus also fighting wars of religion in the name of religion? Even when there was nobody of some other religion to fight for, against, were they still fighting religious wars? It seems they were. So martyrdom and jihad doesn't seem to be the the, preclude, the, the exclusive domain of one community only. It was a very powerful statement that the objects made at the entrance. It shook the public to be able to see this evidence. And that brings us to a question that we ask these days. Is one community's martyr another community's terrorist? Right? So how easy it is for heroes to turn criminals and vice versa? It just depends on the spin we give them. That's where the metadata of the archive comes into trouble. This double-sided piece from Kannauj, uncatalogued largely, only published once previously. You look at it on one side, it's an early Pratihara statue of Tara. Look at it on the other side, it's an Ardhanarishwara. Was this a case of iconoclasm perpetrated by a Shaivite community? But Hindus don't do iconoclasm. We are given to understand. We are given to understand that this happens only with iconoclastic religions. So why then is it like this? Or maybe we don't want to interpret it as Tara, even though the iconography is very clear, especially with that attendant figure. Some people have said, okay, maybe it's Lakshmi. It could be. So then is it a case of sectarian rivalry that a Vaishnav sculpture is being turned into a Shaivite sculpture? Or is it that just the artist got bored, he didn't want to complete his 
Pratihara, Lakshmi or Tara and some patron came along and he didn't want to use another piece of stone so he turned it around and he sculpted on the other side instead and gave it to the temple as a Shaivite sculpture. Possible. What happens in the nature of the decapitation of this statue? Who could have possibly decapitated this one? One of the most extraordinary statues of India. Ramrod straight, this woman sits naked with one plait falling behind her, exquisite in her yogic dhyan, in her meditation. Just one little flower, a little jasmine lying in her palms while she meditates, nothing else. Absolutely nude. You find sculptures in Indian art, seldom a woman absolutely nude. Absolute nudity without jewelry is the preserve only of Jain Tirthankars. Could there have been a female Jain Tirthankar? According to some traditions, Malinath's gender was changed at some point. Was she therefore regarded blasphemous 200 years later and brought out of worship? Statues and artworks have rich histories encoded in them. They trouble us. The museum needs protection. It houses all kinds of data. And we as curators need that protection to be able to disseminate that data. So conservation, documentation, translation are all political activities. So too are designing, mounting, framing. You seem to think very often that it is just a design activity. It's just an art exhibition. Yes, for a lot of people it is. But not when rules are being made in the name of tradition and a country is being governed in the name of cultural tradition. Then in that case, the museum deserves more attention than it is being given at the moment. I'm just going to give you now, when it started with the most hefty problems, I'm going to some lighter things as I'm going along so that I can hopefully tone this lecture down a little bit and end on a more buoyant note soon. Um, <laughs> so let's look at the staging of exhibitions and what goes on. These are, I, I'm touching on all these matters because I've tried to put in the kind of issues that I know my colleagues will be speaking about over the next two days at this conference and I wanted to be able to spur them on and show them slides that I thought might motivate them all into being able to address some of these issues and what problems they've faced in their respective institutions. So in Brussels, we wanted to put the gods in a garden. What greater garden can there be than a Pahari garden? So we used a Kangra landscape and we hand painted an entire gallery in a mock Kangra landscape. And there's my artist, uh, Anais, painting away. She's finished painting this entire Pahari Kangra landscape and then left strategic cavities in which frames of paintings are going to be put in. Sculptures are going to be juxtaposed like, like this. And then there were gazebos. Why? Because the gods live in this eternal garden. You've seen those Pahari landscapes, those Kangra landscapes, and they're impossible landscapes. You know, every possible type of flower is blooming in those gardens, and that is the realm of God. That is the kind of garden in which gods would live. And so we place these garden pavilions in these spaces with the cavities, as I said, for sculptures and paintings to be there. We involve the public by making them a part of the exhibition. It is, after all, on the body. So gallery two was on aniconism. How do we use scenography in an exhibition? So the queue of people, the ticket to buy the ticket, where before they came into the show, their shadows were being cast on one wall of the gallery on aniconism, the body without being present, the chaya. So they themselves became exhibits in the gallery. They became a part of the exhibition's message because there was only that much you can communicate through artwork, but the concept is so rich that it needed help from the scenography. A curator and a museum director and the translator and the exhibition label writer can't do it without the scenographer working alongside who uses the scenography to be able to communicate another level of the message. 
So this was how the construction for that went on, how we managed to create this wall of light so that the shadows would be cast in the room. We did another thing, the last gallery of the exhibition, as the public left the show. The last gallery was called Rapture, the Body of Art. We had everyone's audio guide had eight rags being played. The room was designed as the art praher. Every set wall that you saw had paintings from the early morning to the late morning to the ragmalas from different times of day. The research that went on onto reconstructing the scale of the rag as it might have been in the 17th century or in the 16th century was a very difficult process of musicological research. So we used the musicological, musicological research to get an orchestra to record a special soundtrack for the exhibition. While the public was viewing those paintings, all the artwork was in clear light, white light. But the public themselves were on a red carpet and they themselves were in red light. By the time they had left the exhibition, art was reality. They had become art, right? The real had become unreal, and the unreal, which is art, the artifice, was shown in clear light. We did a swap. Again, the audience realized that they have become the exhibits. Art is watching them rather than them watching the art. So we, we use scenography. Now comes to the installation process, something else that we're going to talk about, because none of this can happen without. A lot of our sculptures in India face the practical problem of being embedded in concrete. How are we going to actually see them for what they are? How are we going to start taking them out of their concrete pedestals? How are we going to remove the sarias that have been put into them, cut them off? How are we going to start actually seeing the sculptures for what they are? The iron rods have to be sawn off at some point. And there's only that many sculptures Anupam can lend his services to and no more in the length and breadth of India. So how is this going to happen? Right? We don't even have mechanisms in place for the installation of our pieces. So when, once this sculpture was extricated, or that sculpture was extricated from its stone pedestals, our institutions get daunted. Na manji, aap to hazaar kilo ka sculpture lekar aa rahe hain, hum kaise install karenge? Kyun nahi install karenge? Aap, ye to saath foot uncha hai, ji haan, ye baiis foot uncha hai. Right? I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, my assistants, they, 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 they're just like, I don't have an insurance policy for them as they get on to cranes and they are starting to mount exhibitions and what they have to do to be able to physically get these pieces in place. I mean, we had to find a special aircraft to be able to transport a 24 foot high single sculpture because the turning radius in the hatch of the aeroplane was not enough to be able to get a single carton in, right? So how do you get an aeroplane that actually opens from the back that's going to fly direct from India to Belgium, and there wasn't, and so it had to go via Moscow, and then from Moscow to Frankfurt, and then it had to come by road from Frankfurt to Brussels in order to be able to get it for the exhibition. But that's what exhibition making involves. Not to turn around and say, we're not going to do it. The job of the museum is to turn around and say, yes, how are we going to make you, allow you to do it? Because we can all get petrified of the scale of the job and say it can't be done. And it's so easy to say no. But how are we enabling a culture in which the people are going to be able to say yes? It's not just in this exhibition that we have pushed the boundaries. We've pushed the boundaries to be able to show artwork in every exhibition does that. Every major exhibition of this scale does that. We need to recognize that this is standard work. This is not exceptional work. This is what our institutions are meant to do. To do. It's not surprising that we have done this. This is what we are here to do. So ramps have to be constructed for the transport of major sculptures. I'm not going to go into the details of how this sculpture was installed. It's already doing the rounds. 
people are posting videos of this. It's charming the way it was done, but is that really okay? The way it was dragged through the halls and it was put on display, who would have taken accountability if something had happened to it? Would the insurers have said that the methods that we employed to transport and install this sculpture were safe? Would they have permitted us, were we adequately indemnified for the methods we employed for its installation? So we need to think about a lot of our practices and what we have allowed to happen. We need to think very carefully. I want to thank you all for being so supportive. I want to thank you for the hard work that you've put in to be able to make this a reality but I also want us to be able to put down what we need for the state of art history and exhibition making in India so that we learn from this experience. Each of you have worked exceptionally hard. Now I'm going to the last point that I really, last two points that I want to make. Some criticism has been levied about the use of replicas in an exhibition. When is an exhibition when does an aura of an exhibition get compromised if the original is not there? In what cases is it okay to use a replica? Well, there are some cases where you have in situ sculptures, where you have in situ work that can't be removed from a site, as with the case of this Tala statue of Shiva in which case a plaster cast replica works. But what are the anxieties of lending artworks in original which are portable in nature? Why are they not lent by institutions? I think this has been another thing that we have, that has become blatantly obvious in this, in this exhibition the reluctance of Indian institutions to cooperate with each other to be able to take the gamble. It's taken one director working over here to work overtime to cajole so many different institutions in parting with their objects. And we must take our hat off to him for doing that. But why is this not standard practice in our country? So is it okay for us to have as many replicas as we do in this exhibition, when one of our tripartite lenders themselves were not lending their choicest pieces to us? Why is it that some of our older institutions in India don't lend even within our own country? Are we going to open up the processes of exhibition making within India, or is it always going to take a catalyzing force from the British Museum or some other international museum to allow people in India to start seeing Indian art? Because our major bargaining tool, CHIP, in this exhibition was the fact that it was a collaboration with a, one of the world's greatest museums. And therefore, we were able to achieve what we were able to. But is this something we're going to be able to do when we're not collaborating with an international museum? So finally, I'm going to end with a picture a picture which is at one of the most nodal pictures in this entire exhibition. This is a picture about gathering and sharing knowledge. It talks about the terms at which knowledge is shared. It talks about the time just, it was made literally a couple of years after, after the Asiatic Society of Bengal had been created by Sir William Jones. Zoffany was a friend of Sir William Jones. Zoffany was also the founding, not just the founding member of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, but he was also the founding member of the Royal Academy of London. I think he's the only person who has the distinction of being both a founding member of these two venerable organizations. One was about the knowledge of art and art making, and the other was about Orientalism and gathering the knowledge and the languages of India. Now, I can't go into all the work that Chris Bailey and others have done about the politics of knowledge. 
But let me just tell you that all of that exists, which is why this painting is such a decisive painting in this exhibition. Because when we look at this painting, we see that the artist himself is giving us many clues on how to understand what he's really trying to communicate to us. He gives us a chevron pattern on either side. If you build on his parallel lines, you realize the grid that he is creating in which he positions himself. The very same chevron lines that you extend, you see that he puts himself and the performing monkey in the middle. What's going on on either side? Antoine Polier and Claude Martin are busy collecting the knowledge of Hindustan. Claude Martin is going to create La Martinea. He is looking at the land that he, is, he has bought, the house that he has just acquired, that he is going to become the, like a factory that he's created in Lucknow. And on the other side, Antoine Polier is commanding Persian and Sanskrit manuscripts because he was the world's largest collector of Indian manuscripts and knowledge in the late 18th century. He is looking at the raw material and produce of India. On the other side, we see a harbor. From gathering the produce of India to its export, colonization is what is taking place. The materials of India are being exported. At the same time, the knowledge of India is being gathered. Over here, he has been sent to India as a landscape artist to document the different vistas of <coughs> Hindustan. When you examine the vistas of Hindustan that he has captured, they are scenes of the dying Hindu and the conquest by the Red Coat British. When you look at the same painting, you see this is a scene of Sati, this is a scene of a new dawn. The new dawn is directly over the conquest of India. The sati is directly over the last gasp of water being given to the dying man. Death on one side, the new dawn on the other. In the middle is Kailash with the Ganges, which flows on to the eternal banyan tree under which sit Adam and Eve. The people of Hindustan have been reduced to art, from which they look at us. The only person who meets your eye in this entire painting is the artist, Zafani himself, the real person. Everything else is either the performing monkey or art. It's an exotic monkey. It's a captured monkey. It's the lion-tailed macaque which isn't even found in Lucknow where Zafani made this painting. It's found in the neighboring <coughs> city. He is like the captive monkey who has been brought in to be able to paint for us and show us what is happening. What are the terms at which knowledge is being gathered and knowledge is being shared? There are multiple ways in which this painting exists and what the artist is poignantly telling us. He's not happy about what he is seeing all around him. He's seeing the terms at which knowledge is being gathered, which are colonial. Look at the expression of the Indians in the painting. Every register has a message in this painting. And the Indians are barefoot in front of their colonial masters as they supplicate, uh, they're, they're supplicants who give up their land, their produce, their information, their knowledge to these people commanding it on the left and right. And Zofany isn't smiling about this. He's aware of the inequitous nature of the relationship between the sahib and the informant. So when we stage an exhibition today on India and the world, and when we collaborate today, we need to think about the axes of knowledge that we are opening up. At what terms and in whose languages are we going to be documenting globalization? So when you embark on projects of digitization and data gathering and creating a database, these are not issues that we can be oblivious about. Where is that data going to be kept and how is that data going to be categorized? 
It's not about India versus the world. It's about being in India and the world. It's not about seeing that the world has a problem with India, but also recognizing the enormous politics and problems that exist within India. So each of these artworks I've tried to show to you need to be catalogued and understood at multiple levels of narrative. I hope this forms something of a conclusion of a talk I gave at the beginning of the exhibition, when I spoke about, are we like this only? Are we going to not care? Or are we going to finally be moved by this exhibition to start making a difference and pulling our socks up? Thank you.